are you waving to them? The man at the back. Where? <laughs> Can I wave as well? Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Somebody waved back, which I thought was nice. Oh, no, no he waved as well. Look. Yes, nice? yes, the man in the back there. Sorry about the weather. <laughs> it's my fault. I'm terribly sorry. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, young people as well. Um, my name is Maggie Dowman. I'm a professor of immunology here at Imperial College. And I'd like to extend to you all an extremely warm welcome to the Imperial College Festival. And apologies for the weather, but, you know, yes. we're pretty good at controlling most things, but the weather is just a bit beyond us. <laughs> Um, I'm absolutely delighted to, welcome, to uh, introduce you to our special guest this afternoon, Stephen McGann. Uh, many people will know you as Dr. Turner from Call the Midwife. Yes, <laughs> we have a fan base definitely out here. Does that, I, I noticed that. Did you, did you, uh, do you watch Call the Midwife? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How many people watch Call the Midwife? There yeah. you go. <laughs> Apparently, would you believe one in six of the British population, man, woman, and child, watch the programme? One in six, that's a lot of people. So he's very famous. So we are th so I'm, thrilled that he came I'm to I'm not talk even the most here. famous person in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you will not know, however, that Stephen is an, an alumnus of Imperial College London, and we're extremely proud of the fact that he studied on our science communication course a few years ago. Mm. Um, so since that time, you've written this extraordinary book, Flesh and Blood, A History of My Family in Seven Sicknesses. Who's read the book? Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're wonderful people. Thank you very much. It's very dramatic, mm. traumatic, mm. but also very uplifting in, in places. Yes. And, and it's all about the extraordinary um, things that have happened to your family, both past and present. It is a cracking good read. If you haven't read it, you can buy it on Amazon. Apparently, it's very difficult to get in West London, but you can it buy it on heard. Amazon. <laughs> um, and I can guarantee that there will be a few tears shed, actually, when you read it, because some of these stories are, are remarkable. Now, um, I'm going to have a conversation and ask Stephen some questions. I'm sure many of you in the audience would also like to ask questions, and we'll try and um, reserve a bit of time at the end in this lecture theatre for a question or two. But Stephen's very kindly agreed to stay behind after the lecture as well, and we'll take you to another room if anybody would like to come over to continue um, the discussions. Absolutely. And just to say that you can take photographs, I will sign limbs, <laughs> I will bore you till you tell me to be quiet and go away. So we'll, we'll, I'll make sure there's some time to see if, if there is a burning question about about Sister Monica Joan or something, then, then, I'll, <laughs> then I'll do that as well later. So, Stephen, over to you. Mm. Stories in your book do tell of medical and social breakthroughs mm. that are very close to Imperial's heart, actually, and still highly relevant in 2018, and indeed, small plug, many of which can be explored afterwards at, at the festival. To hear all about the stories in your book, the audience will need to buy the book. Yeah. But can you whet our appetite with perhaps one story that is most profound? Mm. If there's one story uh, that really typifies the book. First of all, for those people who haven't read the book, I'll make a very, very quick explanation of the structure of it. Basically, I've told the history of my family, my fam personal family history, over 150 years or so. But I've done it in seven chapters sort of seven ages of the McGanns from about the mid-1800s to the present day. Each, each one of the seven ages is a chapter of the book, but each chapter has a, a defining theme. It's seven sicknesses in each chapter. There is one overriding medical condition or ailment that defines that period in time. And so I suppose if there's one sort of medical breakthrough which really typifies the spirit of the book, it's probably um, more than simply a breakthrough, but a period of time. My family, let's make it quite plain straight away, were not the type of people who would be in Debrett's peerage. We are not posh. We are the furthest thing from posh. And in the 1850, we flee the Irish potato famine, a devastating um, uh, a 
cataclysm, basically, which starves many of the population and leads to a huge and very famous diaspora of the Irish people across the world. In the 1850s to 60s, my family arrived in the very successful, teeming, South Lancastrian, genteel, middle-class city of Liverpool. And in the 1840s to the 1860s, which is the famine and what follows, this city went from a very prosperous, one of the biggest seaports of the empire, to a teeming city which doubled its population, but full of the most poverty-stricken and diseased and desperate Irish people fleeing the disasters that were happening on the next island. My family were part of that. And what happened was then quite interesting because the only place that these destitute people could go, which I discovered, was in this, these filthy streets which formed a kind of ghetto in the north end of Liverpool. Uh, they, were, they started to become overcrowded in the 1830s and 40s. After the famine, they were absolutely spilling out. In these, these streets, very small, no more than three or four hundred yards worth of tiny streets, there was very, very bad, very old, crumbling slum housing. They were all crammed into tiny places within this slum housing called courts, which were the worst of your Dickensian nightmare. Um, what happened with these courts, very basically, is they, were, they only had one entrance off the main street. They had six houses, tiny houses that faced each other. They had one toilet for about 150 people. It had no sewerage system. There was no fresh air. There was no hot and cold water in the houses. And into these packed destitute and diseased people. So what then happened to Liverpool and to my family was wave after wave, a terrible outbreak of infectious disease. And the answer to the question about what was the great breakthrough, well, Liverpool ended up in crisis straight away. And it's very funny, I've always laughed about it, but you know, often people can look back at their family tree and say their family might have been poor. But my family was so poor, the very area they lived in this place, they stayed for three decades, they were so poor that an act of parliament had to be formed in 1846 to do something about this. Why? Because what was happening was infectious diseases were basically being incubated in a perfect position of filth, of very, very close confinement. One of the diseases was, was um, typhus, which they then called the Irish disease because they brought it across with them from the famine, spread by lice, by infected lice that hop from person to person in these filthy hovels. But then, of course, what was happening with the, with the good burgers of Liverpool was it was then hopping across to the respectable parts and infecting the rest of the city. Something had to be done. <laughs> and the Liverpool Sanitation Act of 1846 was an attempt to solve it. Now we're coming to the real medical breakthrough. Medicine, as you'll discover if you walk around here, medical science does incredible things. In fact, I'll, I hope to embarrass Professor Maggie Dolman with, by telling you some of the work that she showed me that she's doing at the moment in this college. But it isn't the whole story. What happens in the lab or what happens with the medicine isn't the whole story. They very quickly realized that just understanding these infectious diseases a bit better wasn't by itself going to fix the problem. The problem, like with any great medical problem in our world, was at many, many different social levels. Medicine is about people, and you had to solve the people problem to solve the whole of the medical problem. What then happened, there was a, there was a pioneering doctor called um, William Duncan, who used to go into these slums and through all of the filth and the hazard, tried to work out the pathology of these infectious diseases, tried to work out how they were spread. He couldn't understand everything as a mid-Victorian, but he was beginning to make great strides in understanding the, the, the behavior of the people and how that is linked to the way certain diseases, like smallpox, which was rife. And one of my ancestors, I mentioned in the book, dies of smallpox in those, in those slums. And he began to try and understand what was happening, but he quickly knew that just understanding that wasn't going to make the difference. So he brought two more people in. One guy who was the environmental health officer was a man by a fantastic name of Thomas Fresh because his job was anything but fresh. He used to have to go and clean these places up. And the third part of this great triumvirate of Victorian um, pioneers was 
a man who was uh, Newlands, his name was, and he, his job was to fix the sewerage system because there was no sewerage system. And also, so he was an engineer, and then they had to do something about the terrible cramped housing conditions. It didn't happen overnight, but gradually Liverpool went from a disaster worthy of parliamentary intervention to by the time of the First World War was a world leader in social housing. These people didn't suddenly build social tenement housing in the city, clean, fresh air, hot and cold running water in houses, um, good toilet facilities. They didn't do that out of the pure goodness of their hearts, but it was pragmatic. They began to realize that the medical problems, the, the, the infectious disease problems were linked to wider human factors, the how the people lived, the quality of their lives would have a huge effect on how clean they were, on how, what their outlook would be, and it worked. Gradually over the decades, towards the end of the 1800s, when my family were living there, my family literally started to get better. As the, as the work started by Duncan and the others, led to a greater understanding of the link with all of us as a family and the health that we all feel. And I suppose if there was any one thing that defines the book, is health isn't just health, health is people. And the minute you bring the people in, the housing, the slum clearance in, the minute you give people some self-respect, they, they, they can be clean, they can wash themselves, they can, iron, they can wash their clothing outside, there's fresh air, then you start to deal with the underlying problems and all those infectious diseases by the First World War, the terrible typhoid, they were eradicated in the city. The city became a leading light. So I think that change in public health is argu arguably one of the, the things that has changed Absolutely. our lives. But actually 2018 sees some very significant um, anniversaries, 70th yep. anniversary of the NHS, mm. 90th anniversary of Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin. This is the Sir Alexander Fleming building. And penicillin was discovered at St Mary's Hospital, yeah. which is part of Imperial College it now. Is. <laughs> Um, mm. uh, we're also commemorating 100 years since World War I when a, hu when a huge range of medical breakthroughs were introduced to try and uh, help people that were injured during, during the war on the battlefield. And all of these breakthroughs actually feature in the life and lives of your predecessors. Yes, yes they do. And in fact, your father was one of the first recipients of penicillin. It's a wonderful story, and it, it's in Chapter 4 of my book. There's a very close connection very proud of the Imperial connection as, as an old alumnus. I'm very proud that there's still that connection with Fleming here. My father and penicillin, what a strange connection, but my father in his own small way was intimately connected with the beginnings of the antibiotic age. And I'll tell you briefly how that happened. Um, for people who don't know about penicillin, a quick trot through, 1928, um, Fleming is, is in his lab. He's, demonstra he, he's working with moulds, like the kind of pin mould you might find on bread, uh, something called penicillium natatum. He's working with this. He's got Petri dishes in his lab. He goes off on holiday, goes off on a break. He comes back, and he looks in one of his Petri dishes back in the 20s, and he sees that something around a certain mould, the microbes in the dish haven't been able to penetrate. Something has come out from the mould and has stopped the microbes from surviving and living around that the, 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 the bacteria, and he called it mold juice. And he was very intrigued by this. He said, something's happening with this mold juice. But he found it very, very difficult to replicate. Don't worry, where's my dad? He will be in it soon. <laughs> and he, very, very difficult to replicate, to, to produce, sorry, in large enough amounts to really try it on animals and things to see what was happening. He put it to one side, wrote the paper like a good scientist, put it to one side. You now cut to the Second World War. Two guys, Florrie and Chain, are working in Oxford. The bombs are raining down on the country. It's perhaps our darkest time in the Second World War. Resources are desperately stretched. And um, they're out in Oxford, and they've taken up Fleming's paper. And they're saying, yes, yeah, well, how can we grow this stuff? How can we really start to... To, to industrialize it, if you like, to make it in large enough quantities so we can operate, we, we can look, look at it on mice, eventually building up to people. Um, everything was very stretched. All the pharmaceutical companies were too busy with other war work. They were desperate. 
they couldn't make enough of it quickly enough to really make a difference. And eventually they decided to go and talk to their friends in the United States. In the middle of the war, they went across to the east coast of America, where of course as scientists, they knew some of the scientists there. They arrived in the east coast and said, look, it was all top secret, because this was a great development Britain was working on. But they said, guys, look, here's this thing. What can you guys, can you guys help us make large enough quantities of it in time to help us? And Pfizer, the, the, um, the famous pharmaceutical firm, said, yeah, okay, some guys in Harvard, some guys in Pfizer. And what Pfizer did um, was they uh, used a, a, a principle called deep tank fermentation, which is something they sort of borrowed from the brewery industry to make large vats of the stuff to try and industrialize it. That's fine. They did brilliant things like they said, look, we're not growing enough of it on the, on the bread and the mold the British used. What's a better agent to grow this penicillium on? They sent somebody down to the marketplace to look for rotten fruit. <laughs> and, some, and so someone went down and said, come back. And someone came back with a rotten melon, an American sort of melon. And it was brilliant. So it, it made more of this stuff. And they said, oh, well, great, we'll use that. Meanwhile, across the ocean, my poor father, he joins up, he's much older than my mum, and he joins the Second World War at 18, as an 18-year-old in 1943. And like his, his seafaring guys before him, he goes off to the Navy. He does a bit in the, um, the North convoys, the Russian convoys, working in a support vessel, and eventually he gets itchy feet, wants, decides he wants to do something a bit more daring, he wants to go in submarines, but they volunteer him because he looks keen for um, the, what they call beachhead commandos who are going to raid the beaches of Normandy in D-Day. They've got to be the first to arrive. They've got to, to, to go up the beach and make the beach safe for all the soldiers who are going to arrive in the Normandy invasion. It's basically a suicide mission. And so my father ends up in this elite unit, but a unit um, at a great deal of danger of death. Um, meanwhile, back in America, they're brewing this stuff in a, in a lab in Brooklyn. But by the time it comes to 1944, D-Day was June 44. My father's in Scotland training. And over there, over in Brooklyn, they said, look, will we have enough of this new miracle drug, penicillin, ready for this huge battle we've got coming up? Where they knew they were going to throw so many soldiers at the, the coastline of France. Hundreds of thousands were expected to be mortally wounded. And they said, well, we've, we've, we'll have just about enough for the soldiers alone in this one battle, but we've got no more supplies for the children or anyone else. It's good, the vials of this stuff are going to have to go across the ocean and just serve those soldiers. My father goes onto this beach in D-Day. He gets wounded by a stick grenade at six o'clock in the morning, he's lying with 50 pieces of shrapnel in him. He's mortally wounded. In, in every battle since the ancient Greek battles of Thermopylae and whatever, if these deep poisoned wounds are going to kill you. So my dad, for once in his blessed life, gets incredibly lucky because what happens is they take him off this beach they throw him into a hospital in England, which just happened to be one of those hospitals, which at the same point, they've delivered a convoy across the ocean. I've, I've even looked this up in, the, in the, um, the, the British National Archives, and I see the letters, the correspondence go by where this stuff gets to this hospital. My father, instead of dying, wakes up back in England in a hospital bed, and he th thinks to himself that this isn't right because I'm still here. <laughs> and he looks up, and he's in, he's in a ward full of different servicemen. And he tells me this story. They're gathered around the bed. And they're, they're, these are hardened men. And, and, and they're, they're all talking like schoolboys, showing each other their wounds. And he tried to describe it to me. He said, lad, he said, my wound over the days shrank, got smaller and smaller. And we go, like, because we're in the antibiotic age, we go, well, duh. You take a tablet. He said, no, you don't understand. He was born in 24. This sort of stuff didn't happen. You didn't just get over this stuff. Something was happening, and they were gathered around the bed, wondering at this miracle. It was an antibiotic. Suddenly, they weren't going to die. 
of this kind of thing. He's, his, literally his veins saw in the antibiotic age. But even within my father's lifetime, he used to say to his kids, you're just popping those things for anything. You're popping those, you're, you're bloody. He said, he used to have this great, you don't know you're born. Any cough, any cold, bang, you pop. He was right. He said, you don't appreciate what that was. He had an almost religious love for penicillin. When I was ill when I was seven, I, I became very, very ill with, with pneumonia. And they, they, uh, he stayed by my bed. And every time I'd get an injection with this stuff and I'd cry as a child, he'd say, it's penicillin. <laughs> but why wouldn't he? Why, it, it, without, without that, I would have died, he would have died. This was a miracle, but he already began to see the flaws in our complacency and our misuse. On our, 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 if, if my father died many years ago, if I had to tell him now that not only within his son's lifetime, he saw the beginning of an age that may come to an end, I think he would be ashamed. I don't know how we could look him in the face. Let's, let's expand mm. that because many people think that uh, resistance to antibiotics is one of the biggest medical challenges that we now face. Yes, it is. So in such a short period, we've gone from a miracle drug to a potential loss of the ability to control infections mm. again. Yeah. How, how do you feel about that? Fearful? Hopeful? Can we do anything? Uh, I am many times more fearful, but not without hope. What's really interesting is if you look at people like yourself and the scientists in here, I'm very hopeful there. Do I think that we can make new antibiotics? Yes, I do. I've seen, my son did a brilliant, just very quickly, my son did a brilliant um, work experience when he was 16. We live up near Cambridge, and he went out with some Cambridge scientists who were investigating new antibiotics. And they were looking, lots of the latest research is in places like poo and soil, <laughs> and all these horrible places. But they said, no, no, this is great. Because they, and he went out to find this sort of dung beetle bug somewhere in the fens, which manages to live in really dirty soil, but manages to keep infections away. So they were going, how does that insect manage? Can we learn anything? So the science is there. We're doing brilliant things. But the trouble with medical science is these guys can't do it on their own. We get into a very dangerous mindset, which is that there's a, it's sort of the silver bullet theory, the idea that you can always solve, if we, we can mess our world up, like with climate change, and those guys who work here, they'll think of something, they'll come up with a magical thing. I don't know what the exact statistics are, but we've come up with a brand new antibiotic one this year. We've got to create about two of them every year for the next 10 years. And we're coming up with one every few years at the moment. It's not quick enough. And the reasons for that are not just scientists' fault. It's resources. It's our attitudes. It's the way we misuse them. It's giving them to cattle, giving some of the rarest antibiotics, unbelievable as it may seem. We've been feeding animals some of the big ones, the hard ones, and it's gone into the food chain, making them resistant. If you don't know, at the moment, there is a, a highly bug-resistant form of typhoid breaking out in Pakistan. We've got practically nothing to treat it. So the early part of my book is a variety of diseases we may all have to say hello to again. And if you've watched Call the Midwife, one interesting thing about Call the Midwife is we, it's, it's only in the 50s, 60s, but people there, like my father, remember these conditions. They remember what measles mm. actually does and looks like. We have forgotten, and because we've forgotten, because we've become complacent, we're, ne we're nearing this sort of edge of the cliff. We have to be very careful, and it's very, we have to also help the scientists to help us. We've got to slow this thing down to allow the guys and the people who, who, who give them the money um, we, as, a gov as governments, we also have to make it profitable to the people who make drugs to make antibiotics because, awful as it may sound, there's no money in it for the drug companies. So the profit motive isn't going to work because they come back to the government and say, well, yeah, it's all great, but we won't get much money back for all the years of research if we make antibiotics. We go and do that drug, it's fine. So we've got to find a different solution altogether or else it will be everybody's problem. You know, it won't matter who you are or where you're from, it will come to visit you. Thank you. 
Um, you talk in the book about the new social cohesion and equity that uh, developed in the 50s through the introduction of better education, mm. the NHS, free health care, and the provision of good social housing that you've mentioned already, mm. and, and the impact of this, obviously, on your family. But how do you see all this now, you know, in a time when we're facing actually a new social divide, yeah. anti-globalisation? How, how do you see us recovering from that now? We've got to remember, um, I talked earlier about those three Victorian men and their, their great advances. And I th when you do call the midwife, it's really interesting. And it's been really interesting for me. Would you believe I was actually still here in the first and second series of Call the Midwife. I was actually coming down to college and coming away. And it was a very interesting experience for me to learn about the relationship of science, medicine, and society in the media, in popular culture, and then to be playing a doctor off the telly who's actually interfacing in popular culture. That was incredibly interesting for me. But one thing I did learn was that lots of the things we covered in Call the Midwife, people in the modern age really didn't know some very basic stuff. And not just about women's rights or about the illegality of homosexuality or some of those social things, but also medical things. They thought measles with a few little spots on your face or they didn't realize about that the filthy, horrible ailments that used to be knock around and if we stop taking, you know, vaccinations, they will come again. They really didn't know about those. We, we haven't seen them for a long time. And so the, the, in answer to your question, the, we're in danger of forgetting some very, very deep truths about our collective health, where, which is that a bug or an infection is actually a very sociable thing. It doesn't care about your wealth. It doesn't care if you shop in Waitrose. It doesn't care if you regard your children as special snowflakes and don't get them vaccinated. It will come and infect you just the same, and it will kill you. You know, the thing is that you, we, we, are, we may divide ourselves socially. We may become a world which, which builds silos against each other, but the only way we ever got truly healthy before was when we came together and, and solved it in a big way. And that was a legacy of the post-war era where health got together like mass vaccination programs, mass screening programs, prevention in a big way, housing in a big way, where we made our world as clean as we now take for granted. If we want to go back to a time which is dirtier and muckier, we risk what Duncan observed, which is that we might be nice in our rich gated communities on one side, but those infections that we are creating the Grenfell effect that we create in some other world will hop over the wall and in the end, like with the people of Liverpool, we will suddenly remember very sharply, it's not a life choice, not a lifestyle choice. It's about the collective health of the collective family and our society. You can't avoid that. It's a medical fact. Let's talk a bit about Call the Midwife. About me, yeah! <laughs> it's, a, it's a period, medical yes. drama. <laughs> Um, and you have to be authentic, you have to get the we facts do. right, and you have to put it in the right time yeah. because it's a period. Tell us a bit about how you achieve that and the, and the dilemmas that you face. Yeah, actually. it's a, oh gosh, yeah, there's so many of those. Saying medical names is one of my problems. <laughs> well, oh God, there were some of them, I had to ram them into my brain like an idiot. Um, basically, accuracy, what you'll always be told, we're telling this thing, not simply medical procedure drama, a drama about disease and time, but a historical drama. So you're not just doing a story of nurses and doctors. You're doing nurses and doctors with their heads in the 50s and 60s, where they're not familiar even to modern practitioners or midwives who come to us and say, that's not how we do it sometimes. They say, we say well, actually, that's how they did it. You may not know, but that's how, because we've got a nurse midwife who's on the set with us. But the, an interesting aspect of the accuracy that, that we do when we do the show. Right from the early idea script stage, accuracy is right in at the center. Every single thing that we do has to be checked. It has to be checked by the medical experts who are with us. We even have a medical expert, Terry, who is there right to tell me what to do when I examine a body. To say, no, 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 this is how you do it. This is what you do. This is where you go. This is where you put the stethoscope. And that's how they would have done it. This is the instrument you use. But that's a sort of beginning. The more interesting part of accuracy is, and I use as an example, 
um, we've covered uh, the condition of um, Down syndrome a few times. And just to understand what drama has to do to make accuracy into something wider, actually dramatically authentic, not simply accurate. It's considered Down syndrome. If you asked a medic, a pure, narrow scientific medic about, tell me everything about Down syndrome, they might tell you about the extra chromosome. They might tell you about the propensity for, for heart problems, like phallic tetralogy, which is a heart condition. They might be able to tell you fascinating things about the pathology or the diseases that can happen there. But what about what a child who had Down syndrome might have been called in the playground in 1959? To do that, that is also issues of accuracy. But that is where the accuracy, the medical accuracy, based upon a medical condition, suddenly becomes social. Where then what you do is we bring in um, communities of interest, I call them. Which, so if it was Downs, it was the Down Syndrome Association. You bring these guys in at a very, very early stage. And you say, what words were used? What, what do you get when you read this early draft of this script? You tell us what we need to do. You tell us what we need to think about, whether it was thalidomide, Down, Down syndrome, a million other things, cystic fibrosis. We've done so many issues if you've watched the program. So you don't simply look for procedural accuracy, medical accuracy. You start there, and then you build on the wider forms of accuracy, which makes your fictional situations something very real to people. And a success story, if I'm allowed, are we short of time? No, no. Yeah, success story in one way. I'll, I'll describe the time in series five where we did a story about diphtheria. Now, here's a great example. I've been talking about infectious diseases. There's a disease that we're not familiar with anymore because we eradicated it from our world, our, our particular Western society. Um, and we featured an episode where a lady who came from overseas developed really severe diphtheria. It's a horrible thing. It's it, one, of the, one of the effects of severe diphtheria is your throat slowly closes over until you can suffocate from it. It's grotesque. Um, now, you can read about that as members of the public. You can read about that in, in, in excellent um, websites and in books. But when it's on a peak time television and we've got everything right, you're in a room, you know the characters involved, you know what's at stake for them, and you can hear this woman gasping for breath, making this disgusting noise with this terrible ailment where I had to perform a tracheotomy. What happened that night when the show went out? There was an explosion of interest while the, while the show was on by viewers who, a lot a lots of, of shade is thrown on in scientific communities on the general public, like they're a bunch of sort of idiots who don't know anything. But what actually happened that night was the general public didn't go to some celebrity site to look at the actors. They all went to the NHS website, um, NHS, which went through an explosion. And they looked for the facts, the medical facts, because people sitting there were going, God, what's that? That's horrible. Can I get that? Can my children get that? And what they did, and what I love the public for, because we're all the public, and what I love them for is they're perfectly able to discern what they need from medicine and from health. And when they needed to, for their own children's sake, they looked up the good stuff, the trusted stuff, and they went and found what they needed. And this is, drama is not good for many things. There's lots of things it can't do. It's not a documentary. We're telling a fictional story, but some of the things, the experiential things we can show are very useful, and that's what we need to get right with accuracy. Fantastic. Um, we've got about five minutes left yep. with Stephen, and I'm going to ask mm. if there's any question from the audience that we'd like to hear. Don't be shy. There's always someone who has to be the first. Ah, <laughs> oh, gentleman at, oh, the very gentleman back. at the back. Yeah. No, no, carry on. Off you go. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Absolutely. In the old, we we looked this up. Mental health has been something covered by the program Call the Midwife for a, a, a long time. My character in Call the Midwife actually suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder from his experiences in World War II. So his mental health has become a major feature of the, of the program periodically throughout the period. In my book, there's a whole chapter devoted to a period of mental ill health I suffered 
which I'd never talked about before. So it's a really, really great question. In the old days, the GPs apparently, even overworked Dr. Turner, could see someone for an average of about 12 minutes. And as you correctly say, that's down to five. We, call, we simply haven't got the time anymore. And this is a big issue, because you cannot broach a, a, tr a mental health issue in that kind of time scale. I mean, I would argue you couldn't broach very much in that time. And this is what, as a society, we've got to decide what it is we want in our, in our public health, what we want, where we want to put our money, what we want. But it's not just a few people deciding. It's all of us. What do we want it to be? You know, and this is one of the issues I think is a very important one. So what about medical education? Yes. I don't think GPs really equipped or the way... No, I don't. Are, you know, no. No, and I think in the capacity, in my, with my other hat on, in the capacity for science communication, say, through drama, I think we're more enlightened than we used to be about my father, and as I say in, in chapter four of the book, my father was someone who was a war hero but suffered his own mental health problems. But he was such a Victorian type of character, he could never, he had no real help, and he couldn't cope. We've come on a long way where someone like my son, who's now 21, is very, very sophisticated at the way he talks about his own, his own health, mental and physical. But we still have, I think, some ways to go before we integrate that into our public health in a really open way. Thank you. James. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, it's it's a double-edged sword. I think the doctors call it what is it? Doctor Facebook, Doctor Doctor Google. They call it the GPs, and they always hum and haw to me when I meet them. You know, oh, Doctor Google. But uh, you know, th there's there are benefits. There's still education there used in the right way. There's one. There's wonderful education to be had. I'd rather it was there than not. <laughs> However, the you know the the, I the idea of of Doctor as God, I always found a little bit disturbing. You know, and I think we I think it's more healthy for us to develop. A, a, an engagement, what a psychom as our science communicator, for, with the hat on for a second, what science communication always wants is not just en communication being people of science and STEM talking at the public. We want there to be an engagement. And <coughs> one interesting thing I always like to say about doctors, which is a thing that I didn't often think about for many years. If you think about your mum, like I think about my mum, what other practitioner of science Will you ever have a personal relationship with any your ordinary person in the street? Who else do they ever have a personal relationship with from the world of science? The only one is a doctor. They're the only practitioner of science, really, that anyone not only knows by their name, but has sometimes a lifelong relationship with. They don't know astronomers. My mum doesn't know any astronomers. My mum doesn't know many physicists. But she'll know the doctor, and these people have a unique place to bring the benefits of science and the scientific method in their own small way, right to people's faces, literally an interface, a relationship, where the kindness of someone like Dr. Turner, the, 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 the societal benevolence, is demonstrated through science in a human way in your doctor's surgery. So that relationship is actually very useful in the, in the interface between science and society. But if it's not, if it's, if it's imbalanced, if it's like, now, my little person, I am going to tell you. One of the great things about Call the Midwife, just to finish, I know, know we're, we're stuck for time. One of the things um, that was shown in Call the Midwife, when we got to series five, good old Dr. Turner, who was always a very paternalistic but gentle guy, was confronted by the thalidomide scandal. And the thalidomide scandal hit them like a brick because it, big medicine had won and won and won and won and won and won and won everything post-war. It was the first real pharmaceutical scandal. And so Turner had given his lovely patients a poison. Whether it was him or not, the doctors had failed. They didn't mean to fail. So suddenly, we're, we're all so much older and wiser now about who we really are. We've got a more sort of, we lost our virginity as a population with the, with the great paternalistic doctors. 
Um, and it's, it's healthier to be there, but I don't think we've yet got the balance right with, with um, what we believe we know as individuals and the challenge to, I think the challenge to facts and knowledge, <coughs> cough, cough, Trump, and this world, <laughs> the, the challenge to actual facts, we've gone way too far in science, there's a point at which you say, no, 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 actually, truth is actually really good. To go and find evidence for stuff like scientists is actually really useful. You know, when you fly a plane, you trust that people have tested it and find it, and, you know, and it works. That's why we trust a lot of the things in our world. You don't want to lose that. So there's a balance. On that note, it's a fantastic note to end. Truth, science um, is important, <laughs> critical to us all. I'm afraid we have run out of time now, but just let me remind you there's an opportunity to meet with Stephen if you'd like to, if you go out of the lecture theatre at the back. But just remains really for me to thank you, Stephen, um, enormously for your willingness to come and talk to uh, this audience today and for the fascinating description of thank all you. your stories. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Mm. Mm.